Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. This is uh, a part two of the interview with Ed Joet, the game designer, indie game designer from Shades of Vengeance. Uh, if you haven't listened to the part one, I'd recommend going and checking out part one of the interview to learn everything about the game that we're going to be talking about. And as I explained in the first part of the interview, this is a little bit experimental. It's a few conversations over the course of four weeks that we've recorded to follow the behind the scenes of the Kickstarter. So if you've already listened to episode one, in this new episode, we're going to be talking about another aspect of Ed's activities, which is to support other game designers, which that's going to be quite interesting to any aspiring game designers and creators, particularly tabletop role-playing games. Uh, this is role-playing games we're talking about. But of course, given we're talking about role-playing games, anybody interested in storytelling, other types of role-playing games, uh, tabletop games, I think would be quite interesting in hearing about it. And if you aspire to create a crowdfunding project, it'll be great for you to hear. We're going to go into a few more aspects into what happens in the middle of a Kickstarter project. Uh, if you're listening to this as it's published, there's going to be a couple of days left to the Kickstarter project for The Secret War. Um... If you're not, I mean, of course, you can go and check out the Era of the Consortium and the Secret War expansion at any time on the Shades of Vengeance website. All the links are going to be provided in the show notes. Uh, of course, there's always more episodes to check out for the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. If you're more interested in my kind of more marketing, branding, and advertising episodes, there's a few more guests out there. You can have a look on iTunes. You can have a look on any of your favorite podcasting applications, such as Stitcher, Podcast Republic, which one, whichever it is. If you listen on any of the podcasting apps, it would be awesome if you take time to leave a review, if you appreciate the show in particular. Uh, I'm always happy to receive feedback as well, or questions from any of my listeners. And you can find my details on my website, that's www.icecreamforeveryone.net. Everything spelled out, icecreamforeveryone.net. And uh, also, you can check on the website, there's the Ice Cream Sunday newsletter. I occasionally post on my blog as well, some news about marketing, branding, uh, and advertising, which is, you know, my main field of work. So if ever you're interested in any advice, support from a strategic nature to your business, uh, whether it's communication, marketing, branding, I'm always happy to help. Just get in touch. You can also get in touch with me via Twitter. My handle is at HippoWill. If what you, what you have to say is 140 characters or less, of course, Twitter is the right kind of medium for that. So without further ado, here's Ed for the second part of our interview. Enjoy. Hi, how you doing? I'm doing good. So this is going to form the part two of our conversation of the behind the scenes of the secret war. The secret Kickstarter updates. How are you today and, and where is it at? And we're now in the third week of the Kickstarter, I believe. Is that right? Uh, we are in the third week. Um, actually, there are just just under three weeks to go. Um, and the total was 34 days. Yeah. So we're kind of just at the beginning of the third week here. I noticed um, you just passed the thousand pounds threshold. Yeah. Actually, we passed a thousand pounds, uh, a little while ago. Oh, okay. And then we, we dropped down. One of the, one of the backers, uh, reduced their backing level. Um. Oh, okay. Does and, that uh, happen often? Then, it, it does happen. Um, you know, people withdraw. We've, we've had probably three or four backers who've pulled out. Mm. Um, we've had several backers reduce their level. Um, there was one backer, um, you know, if you should happen to be listening, uh, you gave me a bit of a, bit of a fright. Um, he increased his backing level, mm -hmm. then he decreased his backing level, then he decreased it down, and then he returned it to what it had been in the first place. Okay. <laughs> All within a period of about an hour. Oh, really? Wow. Does, and, so, uh, well, yeah, of course, because you can change your pledge level at any time until the final date, right? That's right, yeah. And cancel it as well. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. I'm hoping that not too many of these guys are going to cancel their pledges. Um, I'm reasonably happy with a thousand. Yeah. Um, I mean, we talked about the, the, the mystery goal before. Sure. A thousand is not my mystery goal. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's on the way it's to a milestone it. milestone still. Absolutely. And, you know, being 200% funded as opposed to being, you know, nearly 200% funded, it's, it's a morale boost. You know, it's, yeah. it's a little more indication that, you know, things are going to go well. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in, in the last in the last couple of days, that's when things really change. Yeah, yeah, you know, of course, and, absolutely. And, until you get to the last couple of days, it's almost impossible to predict yeah. how much a Kickstarter is going to make. Do you receive a lot of like questions or queries or messages from people as well, or a few, anything like that during the during the Kickstarter process, or about this one, for example, so far? Yeah, I mean, I don't receive very many messages from people asking questions about the game. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of spammers on Kickstarter who will spam you various agencies that will promote you on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Oh, uh, um, okay. Just in case any of your listeners ever end up running a Kickstarter, do not go with it. Seriously, guys, I did once. Did you? Um, it was hundreds of dollars down the drain. Um, I got zero backers from them. And, and they, what they all do is they say, oh yeah, well, we'll, you know, pay us this money and then we'll take 10% of your Kickstarter and we'll just use the money for Facebook advertising or whatever. And it is a total waste of money, really. It sounds like it's a good plan. It sounds brilliant. Yeah. But it, it is not worth it. Take my word for it. Just. Do you know where they advertise on Facebook? Stuff. Sorry? Do you know where on Facebook they advertised or how? Yeah, you know the um you you can do paid advertisements on Facebook if you have a page of your own. Yeah, um, yeah, of course. Facebook throw that in your face and they just do that basically. Mm. Um that you know that's that's the but kind which of Which page do they do they just advertise on the sides or or do they you, do they have like know, a, a page with a lot of fans or you, you know when you're just scrolling through and you get the adverts at the side? I don't know about you, but I get a lot of Kickstarter things. Yep. At the moment, recently, there's been a camera. You will yep. never leave home without this camera. Well, yes. I guarantee you I will because I'm massively camera shy and I don't like cameras at all. <laughs> so, you know, I wouldn't back that if you paid me. It's a good thing um, it's an audio podcast then, right? Indeed, indeed. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's exactly the kind of thing they do. You know, that... It may be one of them, or it may be just a, an entrepreneur on their own doing it. It's hard to know. I see exactly uh, what you mean, and you know, uh, you know, taking care of advertising and advising people on their media and communication studies is something I do for a living as well. And it's right, a, it's a tricky one because it's it's true that I mean, it's really interesting to hear this perspective that it, that it didn't do much because in my experience, most of the time, using Facebook for advertising. Is it's not a bad thing if you have lots of money to throw and you really want people to just see what you're doing. If yeah. you're a company, and but it's really more relevant for like if you're a huge company, a huge brand. It's more relevant for above the line. Yeah. Yes. No. No. I. Yeah, but it's, it's just kind of it's kind of like printing in the background of your mind. That's it. You know, it's not going to make yeah. you click most of the time. See, the, the, the issue is that all of these companies will claim that they're going to do research on your staff and so on. Yeah. You know what? Um, when I did this, um, I actually had um, – they, they started putting stuff down about video games. Right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, benefit number nine of video games. It improves your social interaction. Who cares? I mean, yes, it's true for role-playing games as well, but yeah. – you're advertising benefits of video games when trying to advertise a role-playing game Kickstarter. Yeah, it doesn't make much sense. Cheers. I really appreciate that. You've just sent whatever backers away. Yeah, you can't be advertising the whole category. The only person that can do that is the category leader. At the very least, if it was for a role-playing game, the only person who could ever do that would be D&D. Probably, yeah. If And even then, it doesn't really make much sense, but, you know. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, like I was saying, the only, I would just recommend her to anyone who's listening to this, all of those, you know, you get spammed. I've had probably 30 Mm. different emails. Not only that, um, I've had multiple emails from people I've said no to. Mm -hmm. I keep getting them. Right. Um, and they will spam you and spam you and spam you. And at your weakest point, there is a weak point in, in Kickstarter, usually when you're about, you know, a week in hmm. and everything's stopped. You yeah. aren't getting any new backers um, because, you know, you're, you're not, unless, unless obviously this doesn't apply to someone who's so big, you know, that, that you know, it doesn't matter. But, um, you know, yeah, when the, you're an indie Kickstarter, you yeah. get a week in, the backers aren't coming anymore because you're not, you're not featured at the top of the list. Any advertising you're trying to do for your Kickstarter won't likely have taken hold yet. Hmm. So, you know, they will hit you and hit you and hit you and hit you. 
And in a moment of weakness, you will really consider it. Yeah. And I can only advise that you don't do it. Yeah. Um, in fact, grab someone like our host here um, who will actually look at your game and work with you and help you do it. I think because I, I have a dude who works with me. Um, he uh, he runs a company called Badass PR. Mm-hmm. Um, his name's Dirk. Okay. I uh, I met him at Dragon Meet. Cool. Um, and he's been fantastic. You know, uh, we've we've been working together for only a month now, and I've already um, you know I've already had an uptick in sales. I've had loads more reviews done. You know, I, we're we're starting to get out there. You know, so. Don't go for a faceless agency. Find a person yeah. who will work with you. That, yeah, who that understands who you are, what your product is, what your, in this case, game, but it could be a, something else. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I agree. And do you take any other main actions during the course of the Kickstarter? Are there, um, I don't know, emails or anything that, like that, it? That, there are a few things. Um, you know, there's obviously advertising on, on places like Reddit. Um, it's not much fun. We covered this last time, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's stuff like that. There's also one thing that I do every time. Uh, obviously this only applies to role playing games. Um, but I, every time there's, um, there's a chat room, an IRC chat room at rpg.net. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's run by a great guy called Dan. Um, okay. you know, I, 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 this guy's brilliant. He's, he's fantastic. RPG.net is really the biggest forum like site for yep. tabletop RPG, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the chat room isn't quite as big as the forum itself. Okay. Um, but you know, there, there are some, there are some great people in there and what they do is they actually do Q and A's with creators. So, you know, it's uh, like an AMA thing. Right. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll sit down, they'll, they'll talk about, you know, the game, they'll ask you to, to go through it. And I've done that every time I've done a Kickstarter, right. um, except for my comic Kickstarter. Uh, that wasn't really relevant for obvious reasons. Okay. Um, but I'm the only downside is that they, the, the, the audience at a time that is UK friendly, mm. it's very, very small. Right. Um, they're mostly Americans over there. Um, so this time I'm doing something I've never done before, which is I'm going to get up at 2 a.m. Uh, go to my computer and chat on IRC for uh, an hour and a half, two hours, um, and then go back to bed uh, on a, on Friday uh, next week. Okay. So I'm actually going to do a two-hour Q&A on everything to do with Era of the Consortium um, at that point. Cool. All right. Well, we'll be curious to see how well that works, and uh, and good luck with it. <laughs> um, there's a There's another topic I wanted to talk about with you which we touched upon in our last conversations, which is there's a last branch of your activities we didn't really cover, or not extensively at least, which is the fact that you started helping other people publish and write their games, or at least I don't know how much involvement you have, but um, you help other people get their games off the ground somehow, right? That, that's correct, yeah. Um, and how much involvement I have really varies depending on the game. Hmm. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take you through a couple of things that I've worked. But how did that come about then. first, actually, before we? Sorry. How did it come about that you started helping other people, uh, inclu- as as well as publishing and writing your own games? Sure. Um, yeah. What what happened was um, John, my uh, my my main co-writer mm-hmm. on Era of the Consortium, and myself, we were in. Uh, Canada. We were at Anime North. Okay. Um, I've got a, I've got a friend who helps to run that convention and he pulled a couple of strings and he, uh, he managed to get us in there. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we were basically asked as part of what we were doing, we, we asked to do, we asked to do a panel. Mm-hmm. And then when we arrived, we were told, Oh, um, there's this other guy who wants to do a panel about game creation. Um, but we don't do one man panels. So would you mind doing the panel with him? So, you know, there are three of you then and, and it's not a one man panel and, you know, it's all good. Um, so we said, yeah, sure. Obviously, um, you know, we, we were, we were thrilled to be there and, and even more thrilled to actually be wanted, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, we, we go to this panel and, and this guy is the most beaten down person you've ever seen. Seriously. Um, He's he's a successful in inverted commas game creator. Mm-hmm. He's created two board games. Okay. Um, and he sold both of them to companies. Would they be titles we've heard of, or 
Probably not, and and totally honestly, I don't remember them, okay. and, and they aren't overly relevant to the story. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> um, they, um, but but both of these games, you know, he created this game, and then he'd sell it to the publisher, and then the publisher would take it away, and then a year or two later, something would appear on the shelves called vaguely the same thing that looked maybe roughly the same, but it was whatever the publisher wanted relative to his idea so right. mechanics would have changed and um you know the, the whole look and feel might have changed and so on and so forth hmm. um and he just had no say in it whatsoever yeah um and you know w- we were sat in this panel and uh you know people were asking us questions about you know creating games and how would i do this and how would i do that and then someone hit him with um you know how, how do i go about being a successful game creator uh-huh or, or something along those lines. Um, and his reply was, don't do it. Don't create games. You will not make money. You will become miserable. Um, it, it's just not worth it. Don't do it. Um, and in that moment, John and I looked at each other and, um, you know, kind of, we were both obviously thinking the same thing. And uh, he grabbed the microphone and he basically said, okay, look, um, I, I get that. You know, this guy's, this guy's successful. This guy's hmm. done stuff before. You know, he's, he's, you know, made games and so on. And I get what he just said. But if you want to make your game and you want your game to happen the way you want it, come and talk to us afterwards. Hmm. We'll, we'll, we'll do everything we can to help you. That's great. And that's actually where that grew from, you see. Well, yeah. um, we actually had, uh, probably about 10 people follow us back from that. Uh, from that panel to, uh, you know, to, to talk about, um, their games of various kinds. Uh, one of the, one of the groups of people who follow us back are the guys from Dyson Stuff, who now do a regular podcast of Era the Consortium every week. Yeah, I saw that from your website. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, th- those are one of the guys we spoke to. Um, another of the guys was the first of our external games to become a, to become a reality. So, you know, I mean, we decided that it's really valuable to be doing this, um, you know, do, doing this thing, helping people create their games is something that's really, you know, re- really good, really. Yeah. And, and not only that, we're not buying their idea off them and giving them 10,000 pounds to go away and, and never have anything to do with their game again. Mm. We are helping them create their games. Yeah. And yeah, that means that we aren't paying them money, right? You know, I'm sorry, you come to us, we're not going to pay you £10,000 to help you. Yeah. I, you know, facts of life, I'm sorry. What we will do is we will hook you up with good, cheap artists, writers, editors, game mechanics experts. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, some of them will be in, in our team, Shades of Vengeance. Some of them will be contractors we use regularly. For example, artists, it helps everybody, you see. Yeah. Because, um, you know, artists need regular work. I'm not going to have regular work for, you know, I, 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 at the moment I have three artists who are doing, you know, consistent work for me, but, you know, it's not, it's not regular and it's not enough sure. to keep, you know, on its own. Yeah. Um, I'm not that rich. <laughs> yeah, no, no, sure. But I think um, it's fantastic. So, so you're, you're, you're really like building and, giving back to the community, but strengthening the community of gamers by encouraging other people with their projects, which I think is brilliant. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's something that's very core to the way that we work. You know, we, we think it's very important. Um, what we do as well, I mean, obviously again, stuff that comes from contractors that, you know, these guys need to be paid to do it. Sure. Um, you know, that has to be paid, but you know, we do our best to negotiate good rates for you. Yeah. Um, Stuff that comes from me or, or one of the other guys in Shades of Vengeance, that actually comes free until, you know, basically we help you get your book together and on Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Once it's on Kickstarter, you know, we'll, we'll help you do the best it can. Yeah. Um, once fulfillment then happens, we will then take the first cut of the profits. And, and I just mean profits. It won't put you in debt. You know, fulfillment of the actual rewards, fulfillment of the stretch goals come first. Yeah. And if we don't make that much money, then, you know, we, unfortunately, we at Shades of Vengeance don't get paid. Mm. Not that amount. Um, what we'll then generally do if we don't get entirely paid is we'll try and negotiate to, you know, earn a, earn a royalty from the book until such a time as we are paid. Right. 
and and everyone we've worked with so far has been very reasonable, you know, and understanding about, you know, I'm I'm sorry the Kickstarter didn't make however much money we'd hoped. Yeah. Um and and my my charges vary anything from um uh I've I've sat down and with the first guy that I mentioned, the guy we met at Anime North, mm-hmm. um the book was called Amazing Space Adventures and okay. um he'd been working on it for about 20 years. Well, um, and he'd kind of never got it off the ground. He didn't really know where to go or how to do it or really how to present stuff. What was he so, stuck with? Uh, really kind of like getting it to a production quality. Okay. So you had most of the material, but it wasn't just, it needed rewriting a little bit and. Um, the mechanics like... needed a bit of an overhaul, okay. um, which I, which I helped him with. Okay. Um, you know, it was a it was a D one hundred roll high system, um, mm-hmm. similar to Eclipse Phase and and various others, um, and uh, you know, I, I helped him I helped him out with that to 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 get it right uh, for what he wanted. You okay. know, uh, to make it as as simple as possible for people to come in, um, you know, while still being the the system that he wanted to use. Yeah. Um, I helped him out with the artwork. I okay. I hooked him up with uh, with one of my artists. Uh, in fact, the artist who I've worked with on the on the single most projects, as it happens. Um, so you know, we 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 worked together, and and I actually ended up rewriting uh, the entire book to make it a little more um, not not accessible. He, his writing style was not very complimentary of the reader. Okay, it was it, it was sort of it came across as talking down to you a little bit. Hmm. Um, so I did a lot of rewriting on it. Um, I probably spent uh, 100, 150 hours on it. How would you describe the? I mean, it sounds like a space opera, science fiction kind of universe. Is that right? Or Amazing Space Adventures is um, playing in the solar system the way the 1950s sci-fi writers thought it was. Right. So Martian Chronicles, you've got Martian ruins on the on Mars. You've got uh, jungles on Venus. You've yeah. got uh, icy plains on Europa, and so on and so forth. And uh, you know, Asimov. Uh, you you've got robots all over the place. Okay. All of that sort of thing. Cool. Uh, it's 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 a really nice concept. Um, you know, the the game. I personally don't actually agree with the rule set that he ended up with, but that's kind of the point I'm trying to make here. Mm. Um, it was his vision. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter what I think as a publisher. It doesn't matter what I think as a writer. I'm helping him achieve what he wants for his game. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the other end of the spectrum in terms of the amount of work I did was the second game that I worked on, Order of the Link. Okay. Um, that one, it, it ended up being a Kickstarter staff pick. This guy had been working on it for 35 years. Wow. You know, it had been ongoing for absolutely ages. He'd been playing it forever. This is, um, this was a universe hopping game, um, about finding balance in the multiverse. Uh, so, you know, if someone universe hops and unbalances something, you have to go and rectify that. Okay. So would you, uh, so it could be would it be fair to say, it's, was it like a little bit like sliders in the idea of the TV show? Yes and no. Um, there was something of it? You, there was something of it. You were there in order to deliberately write the balance instead of just, you know, sliders where obviously they're just sort of experiencing the world and moving on in no time flat. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it could be sci-fi, it could be fantasy. In that sense, it was a bit like sliders. Yeah. You know, it could, it could be anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Order of the Link, um, the creator was actually a graphic designer. Okay. So all I really did was uh, some editing. Um, I hooked him up with uh, with another artist. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I helped him run the Kickstarter, and that was pretty much it. Um, he, he succeeded beyond our wildest expectations. Like I said, it got to be a staff pick. He made $3,500 uh, really? for, for Order of the Link. Uh, you know, I'm... I'm Every so often he comes over to London and I still go out and, and you know, have a drink with him and so on and, and meet up and talk. Cool. Um, you know, uh, then, you know, there's uh, Mock for Death. That was a Fate module. Um, <coughs> Fate yeah. is a gaming system for RPGs, by the way, just in case you don't uh, know. Yes. Fate is, um, uh, I, I actually really, really dislike Fate. And um, okay. I'm fortunate now to have someone else 
who, if someone else came and wanted to do a fake module, I can I can kind of give that project to them instead of taking it on personally because I really don't want to do another fake module. I, I I found it a thoroughly unsatisfying experience. It's not the guy's fault. He had a really good concept for Mark for Death, but working with fate is is not something I'd really care to repeat. Interesting. Uh, I just I just really don't enjoy it as a system. Okay. I think that it's just too simple for me. Yeah, I, I, when I played it, it could, because obviously, you know, I did some playtests for Mark for Death as well. We we helped with playtests and stuff. Um, and when I played it, I found that I succeeded at everything I did because I only did things I was skilled at. Yeah, but isn't that, can't that be fun as well? Yeah, but I mean, when you just succeed at everything and there's really no challenge and there was never any question of you losing any roles. It's it's a very interesting topic because that's it's at the heart of a conversation I had with John Wick in another episode of the podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wrote a few blog posts about that that were a little bit controversial. Uh, and we mentioned this, this idea that, well, th there's like there's a whole category of games and a style of games where it's really, really enjoyable that you play heroes that are really, really good at what they do. Uh, and that you might fail sometimes for the purpose of drama. But that if you're really, really good at one thing, when you do that thing, really you should be succeeding most of the time. Oh, I agree with that. If you're okay. really, really good at one thing, and, and certainly my system is built around that. You know, Era D10, my rule set, is built around that. You know, mm. you can put all of your points into, for example, Brawl, right? Yeah. And you will be a powerhouse. Yeah. But there is still a chance of failure. You know, I mean, if if you roll badly, and um, the, the way my system works, just briefly, um, you roll multiple D10s, um, and then, you know, you have to meet a, a, a varying threshold. It depends on the difficulty of the roll. But say, for example, it's seven. So yeah. you roll 30 D10s, and you have to roll sevens, okay. or eights, or nines, or tens, right? Is um, 30 a realistic you roll, thing? You just said that as an exaggeration. Sorry? Exact, did you say 30 is an exaggeration, just random number? Or is that like a, can, is that a common to roll 30 dice? 30 is days? probably on the high side, to be honest. Okay. Getting above 10 or 15 is pretty rare. That's, that's a, it's a, you know, big amount um, of dice. <laughs> it can happen occasionally. Yeah. Okay. But basically, if you roll more ones than you do successes over the threshold, yeah. then you fumble. The yeah. more ones, more, the worse the fumble, right? Yeah. I have had someone who rolled 34 dice on a roll. And fumbled. Yeah, that happens. You can fail. It's incredibly unlikely. We worked it out at something like 30 million to one. Okay. Um, but, you know, it's possible. Yeah. And, you know, the in Fate, I didn't feel that the mechanics ever really left room for me to fail. I, I was assured that I was going to succeed in whatever I tried. Okay. And I found that an unsatisfying experience. I want yeah. to have the possibility of failure. Even if it's slight, you know, um, D20 systems have a natural one. Yeah. You know, one in 20, you just fail. Now, yeah. I have my own thoughts about that. I think that is overly silly as well. I think that's too far in the other direction. Mm. Um, you know, you run into combat and you're a seasoned warrior and you have the same chance of just dropping your sword on your foot as someone who's never held a sword before. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, that's too far in the other direction for me. And, and that's one of the, you know, that's yeah. one of the reasons I created my own rule set. Yeah, which is one of the interesting, I mean, it's, it's part of the interesting conversations about game design and game mechanics and preferences and what, what is appropriate to certain universes and styles of play as well. Yeah. 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 I, I agree entirely. Hmm. Um, so, yeah. And then I yeah. moved on to after, after doing the fake module, uh, which again, it, it did pretty well on Kickstarter. Um, and, you know, all of these three games that I've just mentioned, we still carry them at all conventions. You know, yeah. we, we do talk to people about them. You know, we, we demo them once cool. or twice per convention. Um, cause, you know, I mean, we're good friends with all the people we've worked with. Sure. And rightly so, I think. Um, uh, so then, uh, there was, there, there are a few other games that we've got in the works. I can't talk about all of them, but I can talk no, about no, a couple. Fine. It will, um, yeah, sure. There's one called Frontier, which mm -hmm. is, um, it's kind of a bit like Traveller. Which um, is a sci-fi game, right? Stars. You know, I've never read Traveller, so, actually. Yeah, I should yeah. one of these days, but I've never read it. Um, so humanity spread across the stars. There's only really humanity. And, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're kind of hopping around between star systems trying to make your fortune. Yeah. 
And um, for those guys, um, they mostly had the story completely done, mm. um, but they didn't really have much in the way of good ideas for a rule set. Mm -hmm. So I came up with a rule set for them. Uh, okay. It's different from my, from my rule set. I would call it Era D6 Light. Okay. It's only got four stats in it. Um, and, right. you know, they prefer a lighter stat kind of system. So, you know, I, I helped, well, I, I created that and, and, you know, helped them tweak it as needed. Mm. Um, and, you know, they're pretty happy with that. That's going to be coming out. I don't know when. That's actually one of the other interesting things. We don't push you to any schedule. We okay. work at your pace. Yeah. Right. We'll turn stuff around as quickly as you as we can when you present it to us, but yeah. you know we'll we'll work at your speed to help you get your game done. Yeah. So um, what's the best for people who are interested and who might be listening to this and they're interested in support? They would send you an email through the website, or what's? Uh, yeah, it, does it matter any stage they're at, or like you know? No, nope, doesn't matter at all. Uh, we will help with anything from you know I have a vague concept all the way up to I'm ready to go to Kickstarter tomorrow. Okay. Uh, we will do everything we can to help. Um, and obviously the price will vary depending on how, how much work we have to do. True. Um, sure. on the, on the website, www.shadesofvengeance.com, um, there's actually a section which says in big letters, I'm a game creator. Yeah. So if you hit that and fill in the form, it'll just ask some very basic information about your game, just so we know who to assign it to, right? Cause, um, you know, I'm obviously, as you might have gathered, I'm a sci fi expert. Yeah. Uh, Anything sci-fi is quite likely to come to me, whereas, for example, I know very little, or I choose to know very little, about um, steampunk, for example. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it would go to someone else. So that's the only reason we're really asking. We're, we're just trying to understand what, what your game is about. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right, Ed. So by the time this is published, it's going to be just 48 hours before the Kickstarter. Uh, but now, yep, right now, right. we're in the fourth week of the Secret War Kickstarter and the, the secret conversations behind the Kickstarter as well. How's it going? Uh, yeah, it's going really well. Um, as I mentioned last time, I think uh, Kickstarters tend to get pretty quiet in this kind of period and, yeah. and only really pick up again towards the end. So you've not uh, been tempted to... Uh, sorry, you've not been tempted to give in to the, the, the services of some of the people that you mentioned last time? <laughs> no, no, that usually happens at the end of the first week. Okay. Um, by now, it's 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 no longer really a problem. You're just sort of waiting for it to get towards the end. Yeah. And you're arranging as much press as you can for that last little bit. Yeah. Cool. Um, I've uh, I've I've recently had uh, two or three reviews done on Era the Consortium. Um, really? I've got a few more coming. Excellent. Um, one's on RPG.net. That's a that's a big one for me. That's great. And uh, N World as well is also doing a review. So I'll add the links um, on the show notes good. so that people can go and have a look at them. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I'm just waiting for those two to come out. Hopefully that'll drive a little more traffic in our direction. Yep. Uh, my PR guy is doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's doing great and we're, we're sort of, we're putting out a lot of, a lot of press releases, a lot of information about Era the Consortium. So is he contacting the, the bloggers that you're just mentioning as well? or uh, They're contacting us and we're contacting other ones. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a bit of everything. Okay. I, I think that um, actually if there's one piece of advice that I haven't given so far hmm. um, in our conversation, it's um, don't stop. While your Kickstarter is running, don't stop trying to contact people and tell them about it. And I yeah. don't mean – posting a million times on Facebook, I mean, send review copies to people. I mean, it's a digital version of your book, and at the end of the day, not everyone's going to love it, and that's life. Yep. But, you know, it doesn't cost you anything to send a digital version of your book and ask someone to review it. Yeah. And, of course, it pro it's probably always best to, to try to target people, send them a personal message as well as much as possible, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You try and, you know, I mean, at least if – I, I feel that it's basic courtesy that if you're going to be on someone's podcast, you should at least go and listen to one of them. Sure. Right. I mean, I mean, personally, I think that's just basic sort of courtesy if, if you're asking them to review it or, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. Uh, anything else going on? I know you, you posted an update. Uh, you showed a couple of new items that were available and a couple of illustrations that are going to be coming up in the new book. And you have a few more backers, of course. Yeah, a few more backers. That's that's always nice to see, and it's always nice to get a little bit of a boost. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that you know once once the once those two reviews come in, we'll get a little more, and particularly once the 48 hours mark hits. Yeah, we should get a few more as well. Um, all of the reviews we've had have been very positive, very very positive, to be honest. Yeah, don't get me wrong, there have been things that people have said they don't like. Sure. Um, but it's it's been kind of um, nothing I didn't expect, if you know what I mean. I've I've made a choice in Era of the Consortium to not make the rules super super prescriptive. Hmm. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create an expansion for people who want more complicated combat. Yeah. Um. I the the basic era of the consortium is quite streamlined and and quite fast for combat. Um. Which I think the majority of people that I've ever encountered prefer. Mm-hmm. But I know there are you know there are some hardcore groups out there that want some, you know, want some more choices in combat. Yeah. And uh, I'm I'm actually planning an expansion to try and address that. Okay. So um you know I mean that's where most of the comments have come in. You know it's it's. You don't get maneuvers. You don't get hitboxes unless you have the specialty stuff like that. Okay. Um, I saw one so, yeah. of the reviews. I read one of the reviews that you linked to on the on the one of the latest Kickstarter updates, which was pretty positive as well. Quite factual yeah. in the way that it was written, but positive overall. Um, they were mentioning I'm some to like which one that was now. Sorry, I can tell I'm you. I'm trying to remember which one that was. That uh, now was that the that. million word man one? I believe it was the musings something musings. Wait. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wild Musings. That's yes, one. Yes. Wild Musings. That's one. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Wild Musings that they were talking about, they could see some inspiration probably from massive, the video games Mass Effect and Halo. I don't know if that, if that resonated with you as well. Is that something that you had in mind when you're? Yeah. Ma- Mass Effect is something that I, that was very much on my mind, but primarily it, it was nothing to do with the story or, or, or the scale. I, I loved Mass Effect. Disclaimer. Yeah. Loved it absolutely loved it it was it it still is one of my favorite games ever Mm. right um but the thing i really really liked about it and the thing that i tried to capture from it that i really wanted to come through in era the consortium was the sense of what it's like to have a culture that is a bunch of alien races that are used to each other okay that's the thing I really wanted to capture in Consortium because all of these races know each other. You know, I mean, there's been there's yeah. been stress, there's been difficulties in the past, but now you know everyone's kind of over that. Yeah, and it's something I find that, that that we see quite a bit in uh, and the that feel in Babylon Five, which is which what you yeah. mentioned in our first conversation as well. Yeah, he he picked up on the Babylon Five thing as well, actually. Hmm, cool. Um, yeah, I, I yeah, I mean. That's kind of what I wanted. I mean, that and the fact that I didn't want the aliens to be humans with funny faces. I wanted them to be psychologically different. And I can't remember whether it was his review or one of the other ones, but but people have really picked up on that, that the really? aliens aren't humans. You know, they're, they're, they're different. Yeah. Great. Excellent. So, yeah, I'm very happy. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Well, I was mentioning, so one of the things I do at the end of my interviews, and I think we can, we can just go there, is, uh, usually the cooldown question. So this has been a very interesting experiment to have several conversations over the course of several weeks with you. Um, and the last thing I do is generally cross reference because, of course, you know, you know, if you've seen and the people who listen to this have probably seen that I don't only interview people that are into game design. I interview people in different fields that I'm interested in, and I usually ask them questions about, other areas. So I work in marketing and advertising. Um, Ed, are there like any ads that you particularly remember that come to mind, either like favorites from childhood or something that you either loved or absolutely hated anytime recently that you, that you can share with us? Oh, let me think. Um, I'm sticking with you. I remember some random advert from I I can't have seen it since I was about eight. Okay. Um, but it had the song "I'm Sticking with You." Do you remember? I can't remember what it advertised. Do you remember anything of the scenes or like what it was? What was going on in the nope. ad? Or no, I just remember the song. That's it. Funny that's gonna that, be, isn't that's it? That's going to be. It's it is interesting. It is interesting how these memories come about. 
I'm just thinking it's going to be difficult to just look for the song, but you never know. I'll just apply. I'll have a look around YouTube and see if something comes up. Another question I usually have, and well, you know, this is somebody uh, something I ask of everyone because, of course, it's the ice cream for everyone podcast. So, do you like ice cream, and do you have a favorite flavor? I do like ice cream. Excellent. Um, my favorite yeah. is raspberry sorbet. Does that count as ice cream? It'll count as ice cream. Yeah, sorbet counts. And raspberry yeah. is a fantastic choice. The raspberry sorbet in the summer is, I think, is a really choice. I love it. Very, very nice. I love it. I usually it's mix good. it with mango. I like to have it with mango. Actually, raspberry and mango is a good combination. I think. I bet my wife would like that. She loves mango. Oh, there you go. Excellent. Um, do you, what's your, what would you say was your favorite trip or travel and maybe an anecdote from it? My favorite or my least favorite? Uh, the, the one that pops to mind is the, is the really, really unpleasant memory I really that I have. That. Okay. Um, well, all right. Let's go for the least favorite then. My wife's in the Philippines, um, okay. so I've traveled there quite a few times, obviously. Yeah. Um, but the problem is, you see, that you land on a large island, and then you have to take a trip on a bus, and then you have to get on a boat for a couple of hours to get to the island where her parents live. Yeah. So, you know, by that time, you know, you I, I can't sleep on a plane. I, I just, I cannot sleep on a plane, no yeah. matter what. So I'm up for about 24 hours. So by the time... I'm on the boat. I'm dead tired. It's the first time I can properly lie down because we're on a bus to get to get up there. Yeah. So you know, I I, I so lay down. Where, where were you going? Sorry, just catch. to have an idea. You're did you land in Manila and you're going off uh, Luzon? Cebu. It's Cebu. South. You're in the Visayas. Mm-hmm. Okay, got um, it. Yeah, it's uh, it's Bantayan where she actually lives, which is a a fairly famous uh, holiday spot apparently. Okay. Um. But, uh, you know, I, I dozed off, you know, I, I fell asleep. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, it can't be more than half an hour later, I wake up to have um, every single person on the boat pushing past me to get at the life jackets. Oh, God. Okay. Because the crew has announced that everyone should quickly get a life jacket on. Ooh. So I woke up into the middle of, and I was at the front row right in front of the life jacket cabinets, right? I see so you had I everybody up. rushing at you. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh man, I will never forget that for as long as I live. I really won't. <laughs> so, not the best memory, but certainly, certainly a very prevalent one to wake up in the middle of everyone rushing for a life jacket. Oh wow. But then the boat was okay. Yeah, it was fine. It, it didn't sink or anything. Yeah, it was fine. Okay. <laughs> um, it was, it was all a false alarm, but, uh, <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> yeah, that must have been absolutely freaky. A pretty it, it scary was a experience. bit. Particularly, you know, since I, it was just coming out of the sleep, you know? Yeah. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so there you are. There's a little amusing anecdote for you. Nice. By the time this is published, there's going to be 48 hours left to the Kickstarter. Uh, all the people that haven't heard about the, or the Consortium and the Secret War will refer back to the first episode of this conversation, the first part of this conversation, rather. Uh, but as a final parting, is there, is there anything you want to add or anything you want to say to people that are listening to this who haven't backed your project yet? Yeah, um, two things. First of all, thanks very much for listening to me ramble for like two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I hope you found it interesting. I hope you found the insights into what it's like to run a Kickstarter interesting in particular. Yeah. Um, secondly, I am trying to make a new kind of indie game. You, you don't, uh, all of the reviews that I've come across for Era of the Consortium have been surprised at the level of detail world building um, the, the, the time and effort that has been put into Era of the Consortium. Yeah. I'm trying to make this the standard that people should expect. I don't think that indie should be a euphemism for slapdash and, and quick, yeah. you know, and, and no effort put in. Absolutely. I think that indie should be just as good as any game from a big company. And that's what I'm trying to do with Era of the Consortium. So, even if you wouldn't, you know, even if you don't particularly want the game, if you can even back the Kickstarter for a pound, you're you're helping us to make the, to make a new standard for indie games, which is yeah. what you know what everyone has to want, surely. Yeah, absolutely. While everybody, I think everybody wants a high quality of game, and this is what I'm seeing in all the different reviews. 
Is that there? That it's a high quality. I mean, I haven't honestly read. I've read part of it, but I haven't read the whole game just yet. Uh, but I'm a backer for the project, and I'm looking forward to my copy of it. So we'll see. And uh, and yeah, I think everything you've been telling, everything you've been saying about the different games, seems like there's a high quality of writing and solid writing and solid stories inside of it. So thank you. Yeah, and thank you. Um. I, I, I really genuinely believe in Era of the Consortium. I think that it's a really good game. I'm really, really proud to have created it. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't even know how to express the pride I feel to have created this game, to have spent three or four years of my life on it, mm. and to have a reviewer who must see hundreds of games pick it up, and that even one reviewer said this is the best sci-fi game role playing game i've ever seen yeah it just even one person thinks that it's amazing yeah that's awesome it's fantastic i mean congratulations for it and uh good luck on holding up everything on the last couple of days of the kickstarter and good luck for all the future games that you're going to be producing thank you very much i uh i i hope that uh you know your your listeners agree with you and i i hope that uh you know, you guys really feel that we're worth helping. Yeah. Great. All right. Have a great evening. Thank you. All right. And you. Cheers. Bye, bye. All right. Bye. Well, that was the end of our two part episode of that Joe, the creator of Era the Consortium. Uh, if you're listening to this as it's published or on the day it's published, it's still time to back the project uh, or of course you can always go and check out the game on his website there's also a free download pack if you just want to have a look at what it's all about uh and uh so yeah i hope you learned a lot more about what's happening behind the scenes of a crowdfunding project if you aspire to create one one of these days i hope you enjoyed the episode if you have ideas for people for me to interview or if you'd like to be interviewing on the show just send me a message it'd be great to hear from you Otherwise, you can always find more episodes on your favorite podcasting platform on iTunes, uh, Stitcher, whichever. You can just, of course, find them on my website. That's www.icecreamforeveryone.net. Everything spelled out. And, um, well, if you enjoyed the episode, basically just send it to a friend, forward it to a friend. It takes a second. If you know anybody you think is going to be enjoying this, it'd be great. I, I just want for more people to be listening to this. Uh... If you've already listened to everything, don't worry. There's new episodes coming out very soon. New interviews from people in the marketing and advertising industry, people with crazy travel adventures, artists, game designers, a variety of people that I generally appreciate and enjoy the work of and enjoy talking with and have interesting stories to tell. Looking forward to hearing from you and hearing any of your feedback or questions and uh, talk to you soon. All right, thanks. Bye. (laughs) 